Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I just wanted to get us started today for our seminar. Um, we This meeting will be recorded, just so you're aware. Um, you are welcome to keep your video on or off, whatever is most comfortable for you. We will be keeping everybody on mute until the question and answer portion, but you are welcome to communicate in the chat if you have questions that come up as Dr. Donaldson is speaking. Um, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll be sure to take note of them. Um, yeah, I think that's all of the those kinds of details. A little bit about our seminar series um, hosted by the Center for Global Women's Health Technologies. This series is intended to bring leading innovators who have impacted global health through disruptive technologies, novel educational models, and social entrepreneurship. And today we are excited to have Dr. Krista Donaldson from Equalize Health as our speaker. So um, that is where we'll turn it over to you, Nimi, to introduce her. Yeah, thanks, Antonia. Well, it's I'm really excited to have um, Krista Donaldson give a talk today. So. Um, she embodies all of the superlatives that Antonia um, mentioned earlier, um, truly inspirational. I don't want to embarrass you, Krista. Um, I heard um, Krista talk, um, I went on YouTube one day and, and saw her talk at TED Woman and I was blown away just by um, the creative ways in which she was achieving social impact. So at that time she talked about the Jay Purni and showed this individual walking across who could never really walk uh, because of this innovation. And later on, um, she's gone on to create uh, global impact to neonatal health. And she'll tell you all about it. Um, but um, I just wanted to point out that she has um, won a number of accolades and awards. And um, I'm gonna just mention a few. Um, she, her company's, you know, one of the, um, considered one of the most innovative com companies and a World Economic Forum technology pioneer. Um, Krista has not only spoken at TED Woman, but at the Clinton Global Initiative. And she's an Elevate Prize winner, a Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation entrepreneur, um, a Rainer Arnold Fellow, a Pop Tech Social Innovation Fellow, and a GLG Social Impact Fellow, and the list goes on and on and on. And, um, I'd like Krista to, to take um, the platform. So with that, Krista, very excited to have you here and um, learn about the work you're doing. Thank you, Nimi, and thank you, Antonia. Um, well, I am so happy to be talking with all of you today. Um, this is, I have to say, like a bright spot in these COVID days. Um, well, we're still all online, at least I am here and you are there. <laughs> but one of the things I'm really excited to talk to you about today is that as Nimi was saying, uh, we started out in newborn health. We worked um, on mobility issues with the Jaipur knee, but we've since actually moved a little, we've started to move into maternal health, which is why it's exciting particularly to speak with you today. Um, again, feel free to put questions in the chat or however you usually do it. I'm happy to answer questions at any time or at the end. Um, but I will get started and, and share a little bit about my background and our work. And I actually was going to focus on our learning. So Equalize Health is 12 years old. Um, and just to give you the, the story arc here is we had some really nice early successes. Like I felt like we figured out how to sustainably get some health solutions to market and having impact. Um, and you'll hear me say market a few times because we use the market for scale. Um, but in the same time, I was really frustrated because the, as many of you know, this is why we work in this field, there's so many problems and solutions are known yet we're not solving them and we're not solving them at the pace we should be solving them. So I'm gonna share our lessons learned and how we're thinking about it at Equalize Health. All right. So a bit about my background, I actually came into health um, a bit circuitously. Uh, my background is mechanical engineering and product design. My undergrad and grad and PhD are all in mechanical engineering, but uh, I did product design as a master's and then I kind of combined it for my PhD. And what you're looking at was what I consider my first real job. It started as an internship, but was with Kickstart. Um, and they developed water pumps uh, for smallholder farmers in Kenya. They've since scaled into other countries. 
Um, and you can see here, um, this is a picture of the pump. It's called the Super Money Maker. Um, and it would help farmers increase their acreage, quality of crops. Um, but here, I just want to point out, it was the first time I was really seeing, like, not just a solution, a device, if you want to call it that, but it, how it needed to work in the ecosystem, right? Like, you need to service it. You need to get spare parts. You need to get all these things that we know are problems. Um, my job, in particular, was manufacturing. And another insight into some of our learnings with Equalize Health that started early for me is this was a really boring job. You're looking at two of my colleagues doing quality testing and that's all they did all the time. And it's challenging, right? Because at the end of the day, it's people doing this work and they have to be able to do it well. Um, while I was working in Nairobi, um, I was there, actually the first summer I was there, uh, it was the embassy bombing. And I think so many of you may not have even been born but it was, uh, you have to imagine it's pre-Al Qaeda, pre-9-11. It was when terrorism was just getting started. And it really impacted me because as someone who was living there at the time, the health impacts were, were just devastating. Um, I don't know how much you know, but glass blew in. There, was, there were a series of bombings and people would go to the window and the glass would blow in and it would get in people's eyes. There were, you know, thousands of injuries and hundreds of deaths. Um, but it as someone who had been very mechanically focused and engineering focused, it got me interested in health. And so I did a number of roles um, following this. I worked in Iraq as part of the State Department, again, getting a lot of lessons learned around like, you can't just like build a power plant and the electricity is going to work. You have to, you know, think about where does the fuel come from? How does the power get to someone's house? When they flip the switch on, how do they have confidence it's going to work? Um, I was recruited to take over an organization called DREV, which is what Equalize Health was before we refounded the organization. Um, but DREV stood for Design Revolution. And we started out as general design for good, but we very quickly started to focus on health. And the project NIMI talked about the Jiper knee, and then an early project called Brilliance, which was phototherapy for neonatal jaundice babies. Those were our first early projects. Um, but to give you a sense of who we are, we focused on health, like more specifically, more deliberately a few years after getting started. Um, and now we say we create medical technology for everyone. And while this is very simple and closer to a tagline, really what we're trying to convey is we believe in finding solutions and not just the technology themselves, but solving health problems for everyone, meaning in the toughest situations. Um, we like to say that we're a nonprofit that acts like a for-profit, except for our currency is impact. So I want to give you a sense too of like who we are and how we got started in the early days. But many of you have seen a scene like this. This is an equipment graveyard um, at a hospital in, in Western Kenya, I believe. Um, and this is, this is the norm we see, particularly in health. Um, and what's the reason for this, right? What we see from our many years of research is that the big med tech companies, if they're trying to serve what they call the value segment markets, I don't love that term because I think it, um, there's an implied hierarchy, right? But when they serve these markets, they tend to take devices that were designed for the US or Western markets, they defeature them to make them more affordable and then sell them in, in their value segments. But as a result, first of all, you have a device that's you know, designed to work in an environment where there may be consistent electricity, there's enough nurses to be able to use it, um, you know, there's access to spare parts, and then you defeature some of that and send it over to another place where the context could be very different, and they don't work, they break, and that's how we end up um, with this type of graveyard. And it's been interesting to me, too, because I've seen over and over, even in global health when we have projects, there's a big focus on affordability, and while affordability is important, I want to be really clear about that, um, usability is just as big or more of a problem. And so we invest greatly in understanding the problem, understanding the users and like, you know, users, big picture, you have the patients, you have their families, you have the doctors, you have the nurses, you have the repair people, you have the distributors, you have the purchasing decision makers, which could be a doctor who runs a private clinic or it could be a government official and trying to understand all of their needs in designing solutions. So we have um, what we like to call like our main principles at Equalize Health. The first is that we're user obsessed. So really, like I said, trying to understand the needs of all of these users. And it's not just the people, but it is the markets and how the markets behave. 
Um, you know, for example, like how accessible are the spare parts? Are there only proprietary consumables that are going to make it difficult once a hospital buys a device, they can't afford to keep running it or the supply chains don't exist to be able to get these proprietary consumables that they need. Second is we're market driven. I referenced this earlier, but we design our products so that once they hit the market, they have all the margins built in so that they can continue to scale without our further input or ongoing donor support. And I feel very strongly about this as a designer because I feel like it makes us accountable to our users. They will not purchase the device if it's not designed to meet their needs. And again, that's affordability, that's like functionality, that's everything that goes into a product that works and continues to work and has impact. And the third thing, which is very important to me, especially in the arena of global health, is that our products are standard of care. So they're world class. And we believe like no matter where you live, we can deliver. And we, and I mean the global we, like not just Eagle Eyes Health we, but we can deliver world-class products. And this is a point of tension in global health. And I, you know, I'd love to hear from you too, but there's been a tendency too to defeature devices even in global health because there's an assumption around access to clean water or assumption around access to, you know, to spare parts. When we believe like these can be solved if you take a very user-centered, thoughtful approach in developing solutions. And the picture right here is our phototherapy device brilliance. And um, I'm just showing you this picture, but I'll tell you it went through multiple iterations. <laughs> um, as we as we launched the first one, we did actually have three products in the Brilliance line, but um, it, three iterations to get to the impact we've had, which is over a million patients. We'll talk about it in a minute too. Um, I want to point out the model that we had originally um, at DREV Equalize Health, which will be familiar to many of you with um, backgrounds in design. But you know, we start with understanding the problem, again, understanding users, understanding the markets. What are people doing already? We see a lot of um, homemade devices, right? Um, I can tell you with our phototherapy device, we even saw tube bulbs, so for fluorescent tube bulbs that a local technician had made and they had painted them blue. And so the, these aren't effective, but when we see homemade devices, for example, we're like, this is a real problem and people wanna solve it. And, um, and so that's something we're always on the lookout for is how are people solving or trying to solve problems now. Design is what you'd expect. It's like iterating, you know, it's like coming up with the concepts, it's getting feedback on the concepts, it's iterating, it's, you know, testing, it's all the stuff that goes into the development of the product or the device. Um, delivery, we're getting now into how does that device get to people? And so, you know, between design and delivery, there's regulatory approval, which is one thing I should have mentioned, we get as a signal of world-class or standard of care, all of our devices get clearance, either CE mark or FDA. But delivery is also like the distributors and how do you actually reach the clinics and the hospitals that need our devices? You know, if we're selling our devices into like the Fortises or the Cloud Nines in India, these are like the fancy pants hospitals, we're not doing our job. So strategically, how are we reaching the facilities that need our devices? And sometimes it means hitting the nice hospitals first, what I call the fancy pants and I need a better term for, um, hitting those hospitals first because it builds us credibility to win tenders with the government or to move into more rural areas because a lot of the doctors talk to each other. And then finally, we have scaling. We launch our products in India and the East African markets, and then we scale out from there. And my philosophy is, you know, let's start in the markets that are, quote, easier <laughs> because there's so many lessons to learn. And so, um, like, we've had, you know, we've had offers to go straight to some of the more complex markets. And my response is always like, no, I want to make sure we're doing this well and we're learning and we're scaling into the more complex markets as we sort out some of the challenges that we may not have anticipated. And this could be a challenge, for example, like we're not able to track the devices the way we want with the distributor, or we find out something fishy is going on with some sort of like sales process. Um, and there's always kinks to be sorted out. And measuring is very important to us. We follow the devices. I think we're one of the few global health groups that follow our devices. We wanna know where they're installed. We periodically collect data off them. And this is both so we can estimate our impact, but it's also so we can learn because if devices aren't being used, um, that's something we need to know about, not just for product development here, but for future product development. And I'll just give you a quick example um, of like an interesting insight we had from following our devices. We learned um, in, new, in newborn health with our Brilliance device, we saw that if it's purchased by a private hospital, it'll get put into use in about two to three weeks. 
But if it's purchased in a public hospital setting, it can take like up to a year. So between like the device getting delivered and actually getting set up and turned on. And this is really important if you're trying to calculate impact, right? And it also makes us ask like, we know these devices are actually more needed often in public facilities. How can we speed up that process? What can we do to help? All right, so this is our impact, which um, was very exciting. We surpassed a million patients treated last year. And you can see we track um, patients treated with our products. We track what we call patients who otherwise would not have received effective treatment. So this is again, getting at like, are we reaching the right hospitals and the right segments where we are creating impact? And then we also track DALI's disability adjusted life years, which is imperfect for those of you who are the policy wonks, but we like it because it helps us determine our portfolio mix of products. We wanna make sure that we're, we've got a mix of products that are all having impact, but sometimes we need to prioritize time to market or we need to prioritize timing. And so we look at DALI's to help us with that. Um, we're also in 79 countries. I pulled this data right before the talk and the last time I checked it was 78. And so this map isn't quite right because we just added Madagascar. I learned that we had sales there, which is always very exciting to me when we, we have sales in a new market. All right, I wanted to tell you a story though, um, cause you know, I'm talking about like what our model was but I wanna tell a story which is probably not gonna be unfamiliar to many of you who work in our field. Um, but this is a story of a nurse we interviewed named Betty, um, and she works at a level three hospital in Western Uganda, or clinic maybe. Um, and to give you a sense of what level three is for Uganda, it is expected to serve a catchment area of about 10,000 people. It's staffed with both a nurse and a doctor, and it offers outpatient, outpatient services as well as maternity services, but it can't handle the more acute obstetrics cases. So we we like to talk to clinicians of all types and we we have a way when we talk to them we you know obviously we are, we're often like trying to get feedback on a product but we're also just trying to learn from them like what are the challenges they face what are the things that bother them what you know just we want to hear about their work and their lives and in this case um sister betty spoke of a mother coming in for labor and the woman was four centimeters dilated and she was pushing and Betty and her like technician assistant was really trying to get her to stop, but for whatever reason, she was unable to. And when it did come time though, for, her, for when her cervix had dilated, she was too weak to push. Um, so Betty gave her an episiotomy and her cervix also tore in the delivery. So the patient, the mom, the new mom was, she wasn't a new mom yet, but she was bleeding profusely. And Betty and her assistant, Betty told us she was, you know, very panicked. Her assistant was very panicked, but they tried to stay calm and they tried different ways to stop the bleeding. Ultimately, they couldn't and fearful that she would die, they called the local ambulance. The local ambulance was at a gas. Um, and so Betty sent the security guard off to find a ride for the patient to the, the closest hospital, which was about half an hour away. They found someone. It wasn't without its own challenges, I'll just mention. Um, they got they got Betty to, or the, sorry, they got the they got the patient. Betty got Betty went with the patient, got her to a private clinic in the closest town. The, the mom was saved, the baby did not, and the reason the baby didn't survive is because they were so focused on saving the mom's life that the baby died as a, of asphyxia. And I tell this story because it highlights both the complexity of our work. Um, how like many things need to come together to not just save lives, but to support the, the healthcare workers in that situation. And Betty tells us, Betty told us that she thinks about the situation all the time and she feels like it also has impacted the trust she has with her local community. Um, it also re-highlighted to us how key clinicians and everyone, and going back to this issue of usability, are important in the delivery of care. So I want to like, so let's just put that story aside for a minute. I want to show you, um, oh, and here's a photo I meant to show you, sorry, from the clinic. I want to mention one other learning too that we had as we were reflecting on our work um, and the pace of it and how I wanted it to be faster. The next learning we had, we did a study using the Global Innovation Exchange database of global health innovations. And we focused on maternal products and newborn products. And I'm going to explain this chart in a minute. Um, we saw an, a problem in the sector, and this is like funding two global health projects, but we also saw an opportunity here. 
So you can see the purple is maternal, uh, oops, the black is newborn health. Um, if you look at the y-axis, it's institutional philanthropy into the innovation. So I, we call it institutional philanthropy. So it's like Gates, Grand Challenges Canada, USAID. And on the x-axis, we have stages of, of scaling is what we call it. We have, if you're interested in digging into the details, we have a paper here I reference at the bottom. But the key thing to know is that there's been a ton of investment in early stage innovation, which is great but you don't see a lot of projects reaching scaling. And I think you could argue like a lot of these projects probably shouldn't scale, right? Like they have a natural death along the way. But the bottom line is, um, and this represents about 500 projects, slightly more in newborn than maternal, um, but we have very few projects that actually reach scale. And what this said to me is um, there is both there's more innovators, particularly than 10 years ago when, when we were getting started with DREV, which are looking for a path to scale, but they haven't yet been able to find it. Um, it also, and I'll just mention too, like in terms of the number of projects um, in mature scaling and global change, what we had labeled that there's, we're talking like a handful of projects, like five or like, I think two at, at stage five and maybe five at stage four total. Very few are making it. Um, so in reflecting on the, on, on the work that we were seeing in the sector, so more new projects coming, and then again, seeing like the challenges that users are continuing to face. And you know, when we talk about postpartum hemorrhage, for example, to me, it is a moral that we still have a woman dying every 11 minutes. It's also a moral too that we have babies. One of the major causes of newborns, premature newborns particularly, is respiratory distress syndrome. CPAP has been around for 50 years. It's a moral that we still have kids who do not have access to it. So in thinking about all this, it caused us to really rethink our model. So here's our model. The first thing we did, we made multiple changes to our model, and I'm going to talk through them really quickly, is we set up more deliberate what we call UQ units, and this is user and market intelligence. And we'd always been very strong on user research and market research, but we wanted to be more deliberate about building out teams that could very rapidly in an ongoing, like an engine of user and market research could be looking at problems, having deeper relationships with clinicians. And then for example, if we hear about a problem from a clinician, for example, in East Africa, we wanna be able to say, is this a global problem? Is this a regional problem? And having multiple teams in different places to do these sprints um, is, is really effective. And so right now we have two teams. We have one based in Nairobi, one based in Delhi, but the hope is to build four more, one in West Africa, one in South Africa, Southeast Asia, and eventually Latin America. But how amazing would it be if you can have very quick analysis across the world to understand not just how big a problem this is, but what the local and local um, variances might be. Um, the next thing we changed was uh, we, instead of doing the product development ourselves, like identifying the problem and developing solutions, with UQ and with our, our knowledge of user, user needs and the challenges, we actually go out now and we look for what is the best that already exists. You know, like this incredible energy of early stage projects that you saw in that last chart. Are there some in there that have pro promising concepts or features even that we can bring to bear in a solution to, 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 to solve the problem? And I love this because it's more collaborative in the sector, but it also speeds up the ability to bring solutions to market. And to give you an example of this, um, we, uh, a, a, a OB gynecologist in South Africa, he works in South Africa and Botswana named Dr. Justice Hoffmeyer, some of you may know him, reached out to us and said, I have an idea around estimating blood loss during postpartum, postpartum hemorrhage. And we were like, tell us more. <laughs> um, but he had several concepts. He'd already prototyped them himself. And so we ended up acquiring it from him. He is an advisor and a consultant, which is amazing for us too, because now we have a built-in champion who's very well networked through the global health community. But we work with him now to, we get user research in our different regions, and then we've been building on top of the concepts or iterating on the concepts he's given us. And just to highlight the power of UQ, for example, the delivery beds are quite different in India. So the solution that he first came to us with will probably look pretty similar to the, the, the product that's launched in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it'll look quite different when we launch it in India. Um, 
third, the third thing that we changed is we formalized what we call MedTech as a platform. I mentioned that we use the market to scale. We also look around and we're like, how can we scale as quickly as possible, distribute our products to where they need to go um, most thoughtfully as quickly as possible too. So um, with our phototherapy device, we partnered with an Indian manufacturer with a CPAP device that will come to market in about a year and a half. We've partnered with Drager Medical Systems. It's not fully public yet, but it, I can tell you, um, but that's very exciting for us because Drager is looking to move into emerging markets. Um, and they looked at our prototype and their marketing people were like, oh my God, this is exactly what we needed, which was good validation for us too and our user research. So that product will come to market in about a year and a half. Um, but you know, to the point around scaling quickly, a company like Drager can introduce the device in 50 countries in 50 years or sorry, in five years, <laughs> they can scale very quickly, 50 countries in five years. Um, lastly, a new part of our model too is technology on its own doesn't solve problems. I think, you know, the story I told you, if anything, shows that, right? Um, so we've invested in, as we understand other problems in the ecosystem, for example, access to specialized knowledge or, um, you know, any kind of support, for example, around quality improvement, um, as we've identified those areas, we partner to provide solutions. So we offer a telementoring program for those of you who are familiar with ECHO, it's based on the ECHO model. Um, and this came about because we were hearing from clinicians like, yeah, I could treat babies with this, but I actually lack the, I mean, they, this was like a summary of a lot of times, but like, I don't know, I'm not sure I'm going to get paid and I can just refer the baby to the next hospital. From other doctors we heard, yeah, I'm not really sure I can use a CPAP device properly. And telementoring provides a means of both building community, but also um, building confidence in many clinicians who have a desire to provide care, but for whatever reason are. So this is one of my last slides. I just wanted to give you a sense of like, yes, this is our new model that I just showed you. Um, I hope a smarter and better model to bring solutions to market faster. The one thing I'll say is, you know, we are interested in talking to all types of innovators. And if some of you have concepts or you know people have concepts, like please reach out to me because we have a process of like looking at them and like asking questions and then determining if there's something possible that we'd be able to partner on. Um, but this slide is showing you that we are, we'll figure, we're, you know, we'll find out in the next couple of years if this new model is going to be faster and more effective. Um, you can see here in the pink, we have Flow Light, the CPAP that I mentioned. It will launch in about a year and a half. The device that we worked on with Dr. Hoffmeyer, it's called the Materna Well Tray. Um, and that is, it collects the blood post delivery and um, with very clear lines to determine if the woman is in postpartum hemorrhage. And it's just, a, again, to bring a signal in, in a lot of chaos often when there's hemorrhaging um, that this woman needs attention and needs quickly. But our goal is to treat 5 million patients by 2025. And so I think hopefully in 2025, we will have a sense of how this model is working and if we need to continue to iterate, which I expect we will. So um, one last thing I just wanted to mention to all of you um, is for those of you who are a bit of design nerds like me, there was a special issue of global health science and practice that came out end of last year. It is a whole special issue filled with design for global health. <laughs> um, and it's all types of folks uh, looking at impact, um, looking at scaling, looking at all different things. And I'm one of the co-authors on the last article, which is a commentary and it is asking what's next in global health. And just one takeaway I will tell you is yes, global health needs to evolve, but so does design. So I'd love to under, Lee, end with this quote. It's one of my favorites. It, and it's by the former head of the AU, the African Union. It's important to understand that development is not a nice to have. It is essential for peace, for stability and for progress in the world. So thank you. And I also just want to say, I'm so sorry about the passing of Paul Farmer. It really hit our team very, very hard. And I know he was such a proud alum of Duke. And I know you're flying your flags at half mass. And just so you know, our hearts are also with you. Thank you, Krista. That was beautiful. And um, in fact, I was just about to say this uh, statement that you have, this quote, um, is really also emblematic of you know, Paul's philosophy on yeah. uh, social justice for health. 
Um, well, there are, I have a lot of questions that are on my plate and I don't know, I guess I will start with those. Why don't I stop my share too? We can all look at each other. <laughs> Sound good? Wow. Perfect. Um, so I, I was just curious about the, just a quick question on the last slide or the second to last slide. You said we want to reach 5 million people within a certain mm -hmm. time. How do you, is that just an aspirational number that you think of, or is that based on some assessment of what is feasible? Yeah, we do a lot of modeling. And um, I, I mentioned in passing, probably a bit of a throwaway comment to a few folks, is that we, we pay a lot of attention to our portfolio mix. So there's so many problems to work on. And our team is constantly looking at potential problems and potential solutions. And we are looking to, you know, what can we achieve? What do we feel like we're the right people to solve? And then um, can we build our, our pipeline? And I talk a lot about products, but we also have services. Um, and we, we do a mix so that our team isn't overstretched. And then we use that model, NIMI, to determine what we think is achievable with our impact. And so I didn't mention this. I think it's, yeah, it's on the title for that slide, but we're raising a catalytic fund of 15 million. And what that does is it jumps us in so that we have a full engine of product development and service development, solution development. Um, and then we have much greater as an organization economic economic sustainability too, because we get a little bit of revenue back from our products. Not a ton, but a little bit. The whole point is so that we have diversified revenue and we're not entirely dependent on philanthropy. Got it, thank you. Um, you talked about, so I'm now reading off some questions. Um, you talked about the fact that um, you're really broadening the community who is contributing to this impact that you're having, right? Because it's it's great to show that you can do it alone, but you can reach it much faster if you have um, local needs finders, local innovators, um, companies that can scale very quickly. Um, how- I, And I get to say something, we were doing that before, but I would say we weren't doing it very smartly and we certainly had- oh, okay. Yeah, and you know, to be clear, and so now we're just being much more deliberate and to your point, we are being much wider because we, you know, we want to be able to find the best solutions as compared to being reactive or like taking initiative, but not being so systematic before. We're just trying to be smarter and better and more formalized about it all. So then I have to ask the follow-up question. Please. <laughs> what does smarter and better mean? Because the, yeah. you talked about the lessons you learn, right? If you were to, you know, um, sort of share that with our students, what would be the smarter and the better, just not repeating the same mistakes, or when you say being more efficient and more expansive or more deliberate, that there are certain strategies or philosophies yeah. that, and, that embodies, yeah. Yeah, and this, you know, is probably part of like the normal, you know, the normal growth of like a startup type organization. But in the early days, our design process was you know, it wasn't super formalized. Like we knew to like talk to users, we knew to, you know, bring in outside experts, we knew to do testing, we knew to, but now like we have a very formal medical device process. Like we get a regulatory approval. So we have quality management systems. We can be the manufacturer of record. We're getting ISO certified this year. These are all things that as part of our system building, it also helps us attract better partners, right? Like both on the med tech platform side, because a Drager looks at a small group like us and is like, mm, okay, how do we know you're gonna give us a quality device? Yeah. Um, and then on the innovator side, of course, if you've invested in trying to solve a problem and you're looking at a partner, you wanna have confidence that you're gonna have professional engineers and thoughtful um, you know, user researchers working on your problem. And so again, it's, it's formalization of our processes and it's, um, it's building up the systems that we need. And just to give you a sense too, like now, um, and we've had this for a while now, but not in the early days, but you know, we have a gate system for product development. And as new products come in, sometimes they pass a gate and sometimes they don't. And I think this is really important too, because we're also getting better at killing projects early on. Um, and I think that's something nobody wants to talk about in global health because it looks like a failure. But you know what? It's a success. Like we should be focusing on the things that have the most potential of saving lives, of having impact and reaching scale. I'm going to now come to a question in the chat. Thanks for a great talk. 
New numbers from maternal mortality for the US have just been announced and still aren't excellent here. Do you see any of your devices tripping up back to the US markets to address Black and Latinx maternal mortality? Yes. <laughs> and in fact, we, um, I, I was going back and forth on this. We actually have a UQ team in the US. They're just getting stood up. And this is exactly, it is maternal health that is causing us to look more at US markets. We had done a little bit of US markets with mobility with the knee project you talked about. NIMI, um, which we've since spun off, which I think is also um, like a sign of success, like, you know, focusing where you need to. Um, but specifically with the US markets, yes. And I just want to underline your point because I we've been doing a little bit of research and some of you may know the three worst states for maternal mortality are Indiana, Mississippi, and Georgia, which are worse than half the countries in the world. So we have a lot of work to do. I think, um, again, uh, there are solutions that you know can be translated or you can start with one, but the point is always to do the user research and, and design for the need. So again, we might have end up with like three different products, one that's for the Sub-Saharan African market for the blood loss monitoring device, one for the South um, Asia market and the one for the US market. Thank you. Um Another question is, how do you see these design practices evolving to address non-healthcare practices like clean energy or water resources? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, to me, so much of design needs to be driven by users. <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what field you're in, and you know, and I started out in agriculture, right? Like, who, like who knew? <laughs> who knew a bombing would put me into health, right? But it's a lot of the same. It's a lot. It was a lot of the same design process. Of course, there's different things, and there's different requirements, and there's different regulations for different fields, and there's different practices. And just to give you a sense, um, I'll just compare agriculture to health for a moment. Um, with agriculture, you know, whether you're working on a pump for the Kenyan highlands are one that's closer to the coast, you're dealing with very different product requirements, right? Like you're gonna need to be able to pull water from um, a deeper depth if you're in the highlands. And if you're closer to the coast, you might have a lower you know, water table that's easier to access, but there also might be salinity. Healthcare is, um, is a bit different. Of course, there's different cultural nuances, there's different equipment, there's different procedures, but for the most part, there's a lot of things that are similar, but it's that user research that really helps you understand that and set the direction for the solution development. And sometimes, you know, it's not a product, like to be really clear, sometimes it's a solution or sometimes it's like, you know, even looking at tariff structures in a country and advocating to lift tariffs so that appropriate solutions can come in. And that's all part of the good user research and figuring things out. And I guess that's also part of that formalization process that you're talking yeah. about. Right? You can actually sort of continue to evolve it um, yeah. with more structures in place. So you talked about the fact that, um, you know, you have innovations, products, but you also have services, right? Like telementoring, um, uh, nutrition, um, other things that are, that are supportive but yeah. not necessarily technologies. And so uh, in the one instance, it seems like, and I know you mentioned for-profit is, you know, your currency's, in, your, your currency's impact, but how do you um, support these somewhat disparate activities? I mean, they, they are synergistic, but disparate in terms of what is technology development and what is more services. Right. They seem like, um, First of all, from a funding perspective, they would be very different. Um, you know, some, one sounds more like a social um, uh, organization towards, you know, advocacy and health, and health, whereas the other one seems more like, you know, here are products for health. And I don't mean to be so black and white, but I was no, just- No, 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 but you're right. And funders are very, like, as many of you know, like, they're very, like, we fund this, we don't fund this, and probably not that. <laughs> So, um, but what we have found is um, in some ways it's been easier to raise funds for the, what we call the downstream innovations. And we like to, we like to always be keeping an eye out for them. And we really approach solving those with partners. So to give you a sense, I talked about Echo. We leveraged the Echo model when we heard, of, when we were learning about, you know, clinicians who, you know, were demoralized essentially and didn't 
feel like they could provide care in their facilities. And we found that the telemetry model was very, very effective. And I would say the telemetry model in its purest form, for those of you who are familiar with ECHO, like a group of 20 um, clinicians, no more, because you're not like going for the numbers, you're going for better outcomes. And they talk, you know, the clinicians are led by a local expert. We help facilitate it, but a local expert in the local language. Um, they talk about cases you're really trying to get rid of hierarchy so people talk about the challenges you know, that they're facing. And we found this is a very effective model. Another um, area is around quality improvement. So um, we've been working with the Vermont Oxford Network in newborn health. And what they do is they, they set up databases in hospitals and NICUs. And then using that data, they identify areas for improvement and we'll do training, which is a very nice sync up actually with the telemetry. Um, we also have an initiative around supporting uh, the development of local associations. And so, for example, this overlaps with our telemetry. And again, because we work with um, different medical associations across India and also like the Biomed Association, like the people who repair the products in Kenya, which is a huge demand. Um, and it's that sort of thing. In terms of funding, what we found is um, we have a set base of donors who are really intrigued by supporting these initiatives, not just for our work, but because, and I believe this very strongly, it's strengthening the overall ecosystem for everyone. So, um, you know, our devices will get used more, they'll be better maintained, but so will everyone else's, which to me is like such a big impact win. Right. Um, so there's another question. Um, I love all these questions. Thanks everyone. <laughs> um, excellent talk, thank you. My question is a little bit more bigger picture. While working on clinical device testing abroad, I've at times run into problems related to international aid. For example, a shortage of a drug was not reported because it would lead to disclosures of corruption, which could then reduce aid to that country. Um, I'm wondering if Equalized Health has experienced issues with the aid ecosystem and how we can reimagine helping with development in other countries to avoid these issues? So yes, we have run into issues. Um, we run into issues both with the aid establishment and we run into issues with the private sector. And I think any of us who've done any work, um, I mean, there's corruption in the US too, right? Um, just to be clear. So we, we treat corruption and challenges like this as a design constraint. So I'll just say that up front. And I think to me, like, that's a really important mental shift for all of us. I don't like like the judgy stuff, like, oh, <laughs> there's corruption here. It's a constraint, like just get used to it. We design for it, we move on. Um, of course, we behave ethically. We follow all the international laws and everything like that. That said, um, you know, our model works best with the private sector. Um, and so we, like I had mentioned how we launch an easier market. So we look at um, markets which have a develop, developed or developing private sector. So Philippines is a really interesting one too, um, has high need um, where we can have impact. And then we also look at the barriers to enter the market and barriers to enter the market could be a very unfavorable like registration scheme. So there's some countries, for example, that have essentially blocked out international newborn health devices because they have a very strong local <laughs> company that does it. And so we just try and be very mindful of all of that. But most of our work is through the private sector and even in the public sector, which we still very much try and win tenders because there's so much impact to be had. But when there's anything, you know, kind of funny, like, oh, we want devices for all our hospitals, we will go in and be like, no, actually you can only use this device at like half the facilities you're asking for or a donor comes in and says, we wanna purchase devices for all the facilities in this county, in this country. And we'll say, um, well, why don't we give you our data sheet and data sheets from like three other devices. And we'd like you to take them to, you know, the decision maker in the county and they would need to choose this device. And, you know, we would recommend you pay very close attention to the data on like ownership and donation and the value of things. And so we do what we can. Um, and, uh, but I think, you know, this is a very real problem and again, you know, treat it as a design constraint. Thank you. Um, another question is, um, you, you know, talked about needs finding and, um, innovations coming from local champions so that, you know, they are at the level of the problem and that's really helpful in designing for that site or location. But I'm, I'm curious whether, um, that extends to also thinking about manufacturing. So are, 
are what's the potential of say manufacturing it locally yeah um, so it's at some remote site and then having things shipped. yeah this and does it make the problem does it make reduce the barriers to do so some of the yeah, so this is something too that I think is going to continue to evolve. We, when we're determining, so we work with contract manufacturers and like in the case with Drager, what we'll do is we'll manufacture the CPAP, we'll be the manufacturer record, we manage quality control, and then it is branded as a Drager device, not as an equalized health device. Um, so that determination of that model is based on lessons learned with a previous manufacturing partner where things went well and things didn't and i'll say in that case um we didn't always have the best control over quality so we were like always you know in their face <laughs> trying to fix things but the important part of this is is we look at what is the best path to get quality products and solutions to the people who need it most. And so we will look at a range of manufacturers. Um, we take into consideration, for example, um, local government perks. And an example of this, for those of you who are familiar with MedTech in India, there's a Make in India initiative. So um, tenders will go to devices made in India before they will go to devices made outside of India. Um, we look very closely at what makes the most to serve Sub-Saharan African markets. I can tell you right now, um, manufacturing things in Cape Town and then sending them across Africa is more expensive than bringing them in from India. So we look very closely at all of this. Um, we, we work with as many local manufacturers as we can. All of our manufacturing, manufacturing is done in market, and, but this will be something we continue to look at as the manufacturing sectors in different geographies strengthen as well. I'm not ignoring you, I'm writing as you no, speak. No, no, that's totally fine, I figure. <laughs> that's so interesting right. writing all this down, these Nibby. That, these are things that you know, our team will talk about afterwards, I'm sure. Um, so let me go back to the Google Doc and see. Um, um, so coming back to the idea of getting things to people who need it the most, right? The best mm -hmm. path. So an, another challenge, so I'm, I'm, I guess we all know some of the, the global marketplaces, right? Like the Amazon equivalent global marketplaces that can distribute solutions widely. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily a company that can reach, you know, 50 countries right. in five years. Um, and there are many products that are sold that way. And then when they get to the marketplace, people can buy that and distribute it to the private sector or otherwise. Yeah. So in those instances, if you're trying to get you know things that are affordable to people who need it the most one can imagine that the distributors could control that process right if you want yeah. to so i'm just curious about that model versus some of the other models and is it is it that one is better than the other or are there trade-offs because obviously it's a very um, uh reliable not reliable but an easy way to get access to many different types of technologies yeah, I would agree with that. You know, one of the hardest lessons learned we had with Brilliance is, um, <laughs> maybe you may have heard the story before, but when we, when the first like 25 units came off the line, like you can just imagine, we were so excited um, and our partner was so excited and five of those units got sold, they were to be sold in India, but five got sent to the Philippines and the distributor in the Philippines turned around and marked up something that should have been about $500 retail to $2,100 retail. <laughs> And the distributor was like, I don't, I don't have to follow your nice social sector <laughs> model. Um, and so it taught us to get very involved with distributors. Um, so this, the distributor landscape is constantly changing is one thing I'll say too. We are seeing um, new and emerging distri uh, distributors come up. We're seeing distributors like come up, shut down, come up, shut down, all sorts of things. Um, that said, um, price margins are key right um and price margins with distributors affect like their ability to respond to servicing and what the arrangements are and so this is just something that we keep an eye on again we we structure our distribution as much as possible for transparency because we want to know where the devices are going and what kind of impact they're having um one thing i'll just mention again for like the other like global health like commercial pathways nerds 
<laughs> is uh, managed equipment services, which is, you know, the idea that uh, the companies get paid based on the use of devices, which incentivize the, incentivizes them to maintain devices and facilities. And so this has been running in Kenya, I would say, probably with mixed results because of issues we discussed earlier. But in some cases, like you go into a rural hospital and the GE equipment is in like perfect shape while they don't have like gloves, right? Because of this. So I think there's there's some potential too on like a new model around managed equipment services um, to both get devices to where they're needed, but to ensure that they're serviced and they're maintained and they're doing what they need to. Um. Okay, so this is a question I have, which is probably a little bit selfish, but I'll put it out there. So you have this really nice formalized model that keeps evolving. I mean, I could almost think a book coming out of it, right? Because there's so many things to be learned across the board, right? Not just yeah. maternal health. Um, and something that's, I think, woefully lacking. I mean, I just think about students, right? And so where do you go to for this kind of intelligence? I mean, should I send them all to Krista Donaldson? Um, but th there's a real gap, right? In, in, in taking those life experiences through this innovation process and not only formalizing it, but being able to put it together in a cohesive manner that others can actually build off of. Yeah. So how do you see this model? And I know you're gonna say, well, we have to focus on certain things first, but how do you see this model actually impacting um, global health technologies writ large, given the fact that there are many solutions that actually fall in their face and die. Yeah. And there have been other reasons as to why they die, not necessarily because they failed to solve a problem. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you've got lots of <laughs> questions in there, as would I. The one thing I would say, like in impacting the global health community writ large, I think there's a lot of things. I hope that if we've been able to impact it, one of them is that it is possible and it is the right thing to do to bring contextually appropriate world-class products into these markets. I mean, for too long, many of you, many of you might remember the appropriate technology movement, which was like, you know, like these kind of rough devices made of like spare parts that, you know, were expected to save babies' lives or to provide whatever. And to me, like, that's ridiculous. Like, I think it's also, um, it, also is perpetuating inequality, right? Because we're not recognizing the importance of the context that these very hardworking healthcare workers are working in. And we didn't even get into like how much turnover there is. Like so much of our design process, we are looked at like, how do we minimize stress on the healthcare workers? You know, in, in neonatal intensive care units in the US, it's like one nurse or one or two nurses per baby. In most of the places we work, it's like, I think it averages eight babies per nurse, but we've seen as high as like 50 babies per nurse across multiple rooms in NICUs on the weekend and in different places because, you know, nurses aren't paid very well and there's high turnover and all these sorts of things. So, you know, long way of saying, um, there's a lot of work our sector needs to do. And I think part of it is like looking at our own history, which by the way, in the paper I wrote, we did a nice analysis of the history of global health and it's pretty colonial, which I think is probably no surprise to anybody, but it still shapes the way we think today. And, um, and I really hope that we, especially all of you younger generation who are so much savvier and thoughtful, I think, than our older generations, like you're gonna, you're gonna really move us forward in the sector. Well, on that note, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to all of us. And uh, this was fascinating. And Krista, don't be surprised if I start sending you emails. But... Yes, I would love that. And thank you all. Yeah. And it's so lovely to be able to speak with you and such an honor. So good luck with all your work. And yeah, please stay in touch. Thank you, Krista. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.